Good day, good evening, happy new year and happy new you. My name is Bruce Montgomery and can you believe it? We are going into our 16th year of technology access television. I'm glad you are still here with me on this ride of technology, business, community change and all things innovation. I'm delighted to able to uh, still have this conversation. And you know, so many things have happened over these 15, now 16 years. I cannot even believe it. People are watching this show all around the world. They're watching it online. They're watching it on their mobile devices. And yet this conversation is only just begun. My guest today to open up this new season of conversations on technology and innovation is a longtime friend of mine. And it could not be a better person to be in the studio today than to describe how the inflection of change and opportunity and angst and emotion and all of this is coming together, yet people have to find a way to survive and to thrive. And my guest has joined a vernable institution, an institution that is so synonymous with the name of Chicago, it is in their very name. The name, of course, is the publication, The Chicago Defender. Yes, the icon of 110 years providing news and information to a community and to a people across this country, and I would dare say across this world. And she has brought her journalistic and creative talents to this task, and I'm glad she can be here today to maybe illumine us on not only this year that has just passed, but the year ahead, what it holds for her, what it holds for this institution, what it holds for this city, what it holds for this country. My guest today is none other than my good friend, Kai El Zabar. Hello, Bruce. <laughs> <laughs> How thanks are you? For, I'm wonderful, and thanks for having me on today. Thank you. I'm so glad you could make uh, time away from your deadlines to be here. Yes, we Thank were just <laughs> laughing about that. You know, even though the media may change, the deadlines are still the same. They still, this, yeah, they say the same. You know, I just wanted to add something to what you were saying in terms of the Chicago, you know, defender reaching the whole world. I had a friend who sent me a message on Facebook who lives in uh, Tunisia right now. Mm -hmm. And she uh, noted, made a note to make you know me aware that she had seen uh, Reverend Jackson on television holding up the Chicago Defender. Right on. You know, so yeah. I saw you on my cellular device Mm. Uh, laying down. Oh my God! Yeah. <laughs> and I looked. I said, "I know that's not Kai on the ground." Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, carrying out yes. Uh, this uh, a lie, lay in or uh, this response. To, hands up! You know, it's, don't it's, shoot. Hands up! Don't shoot. Here yeah. we are, and we were talking about this. You know, we've known each other uh, the majority of our time. Well, all, on of this our planet. <laughs> all of our adult life. All of our adult life. Yeah. And I, I really have to say that I know we were so wild-eyed and so uh, atmospheric and we were just wanting to change the planet and do so many different things. If somebody would have told us that in the year 2015 mm -hmm. that some of the things that went on uh, and is going on right now would still be going on, would you have believed that? Would you? No, was that what we? Not. No. No, no. I really thought we would be living in a more nirvana my <laughs> world. <Right. laughs> Why I thought that I don't know, Me but too. Uh, you know things like the Ferguson, you know, instant. Uh, in what am I trying to say? Uh, incident. Incident. Mm -hmm. The um, Eric Gardner, you know, and then of course I think the young man's name is Aki uh, Gurley, who was also shot in Brooklyn, and most people haven't spoken about That's that. Correct. But he was walking in the apartment building of his girlfriend at night, walking her to her apartment. There was a rookie cop in there and he just shot him. You know, never said who's there. They didn't have, a, I don't know, they didn't use a flashlight. And then Bratton got on television and said it was a, you know, a, a, just a mistake because it was a dark hallway. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, this is someone's life. So those types of things continue to happen and have been going on. I mean, of course, we have to go back and look at Trayvon Martin, right? Yes. And those, so many of the uh, young people before that. And so it, it continues. Who would have thought? I certainly wouldn't have. We thought racial relations were going to be a lot different. But like you said, you as a lifelong uh, writer, communicator, creative person, you, you've done a lot of different things, both your own artistic endeavors with the word and then being in the industry as an editor. Uh, you made a decision, or did somebody make a decision <laughs> to say, why don't you come back? 
to Chicago at this time and join this institution that they're not through yet. They, the, the defender isn't throwing in the towel just yet. There are still some moves to be made, some issues to be addressed, some communities to be engaged. Was this a challenge that you, you literally felt compelled to connect and to engage with to come back and be a part of this uh, Defender activity? Well, the initial thought, yes, because I had been living in Los Angeles and I was really living the easy breezy California life <laughs> and I liked it. Mm -hmm. You know, I had my own publishing company, M2M Publishing. We've published 10 authors uh, since 2006 and it was doing well. I, I enjoyed my life. However, when Cheryl Maynard, our new publisher, uh, came on board, she called me, we've worked together in the past before, right? And she said, Kaye, I can't do this alone. You know, it takes a team, and we've mm -hmm. always worked as a team. I want to bring my team together. Wow. And uh, the rest is history. So mm -hmm. she brought myself on and, you know, two others, and you're going to meet one of them okay. in a minute. Yeah. Well, this is, uh, but, but tell us a little bit about, uh, before we jump right into the Defender, talk a little bit about, um, as an entrepreneur, Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of what I talk about in this show has to do with technology, but a lot of it is the intersection of technology and entrepreneurship. Okay. Uh, looking at uh, how you as an entrepreneur, uh, the last, uh, what has it been, eight, ten years you've been? Sixteen. Sixteen years. <laughs> Seems like yesterday. Sixteen. <laughs> Sixteen years being an entrepreneur. Uh, what 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 is what what is that like? Uh, being an entrepreneur and, and calling your own shots, and then now having to bring that. Well, to I think when you first begin, you know, coming or leaving the the comfort or the umbrella of a established company, it's learning that you are responsible every day for your bread and butter. It's totally mm -hmm. different than going into an office and doing your work, you still do your work, and getting a check. But we have to generate the business, right? You have to market your business, and then you have to follow through and deliver, mm -hmm. you know, your business, and then you have to also make sure you get paid. And that was a little surprising to me because I'm like, okay, I do my work, I send you the invoice, you should pay me, <laughs> right? It didn't, it to... didn't, you know, sometimes you have to, you know, you have to chase your own money. And I think that was the most challenging thing. But once I figured that out and got in front of it, because you have to get in front of it, mm -hmm. it ended up working, you know, fine. But I think that the, the major difference for me in, in terms of the, how it functions, again, I was saying I lived the easy breezy life and I had a published company, published books. But the way that I would do that, the way that I edited, I could go to Starbucks, you know, and sit and do my editing. I could work from home. I could go to the beach, you know, and sit and write and do that. And, you know, in my own time and my comfort, and I got the work done. And, and over those 16 years, did you start to see the inflection? I mean, over those 16 years, there was uh, the submergence of new media, there was the impact of these new technologies. You, you saw what was happening in the music and the film industry, yes. industries yes. that you were connected yes. to. Did you start to have some sense that this technology thing is not going away and I better figure out a number of ways that I want to play in that? Yes. And did you start playing in some of those ways with your publishing efforts? Absolutely, and I, I just want to share this story. Uh, Paul Maynard, who has worked with me on several endeavors, is our, was our director for particular publication that we were doing in, I think it was 2000 through 2003. And I didn't have a cell phone then because I was just like, I don't want to have, you know, I, did, I had it, but I didn't really want to use it. And he says, look, I have to stay in communication with you. And he, and he actually, was, was he in Atlanta and you're in LA? He was in Atlanta, but he would fly to okay. LA, right, right to, to do the work. And we would work together and, and hammer it out. But it, he, so one day he just, walked me into Sprint, bought the phone, and said, you need the phone. And I've had that phone <laughs> ever since. And I laugh now at people who are like, I don't want the cell phone or whatever. It's very, you know, technology today is very, very important. I don't 
I'm not attached to it, I think, in the same way as our youth. Mm -hmm. But I see the, the necessity for it as well as, as the value. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And so who would have thought we could do what we do now, read the newspaper, you know, via our cell phone device, or watch a movie, watch TV as it is, you know, in real time, which is, by the way, the name of our parent company, Real Time Media. Mm -hmm. And so uh, for us right now, uh, digital is first. And what my responsibility is, is to balance, right, the print, because we know that the future is right now. And so that's why we have to really it, you know, really accept this whole new world that you're talking about because that's the youth. That's where, the, that's where their world is going. That's where their world is. But at the same time, the Chicago Defender, which is an iconic brand, has readers that are 101. You understand what I'm saying? Mm. And we will be celebrating our 110th year uh, wow. anniversary, 2015. And so the whole point is, is that we have to bring both of them together, find that balance, and appeal to our entire, you know, market. That's an awesome uh, challenge, and it's a challenge that takes on many different facets. Mm -hmm. It takes on creativity. But the reason I asked you about entrepreneurship is now, even though you were your own entrepreneur, yes. and even though you're a communicator, a writer, a creative at heart, you still have to have that tough-mindedness as a business person because the only way this is going to make sense, it has to make business sense as well. And there's got to be some economic justification for this continuing. But speaking about the, the intersection between um, the community. Yes. Uh, oftentimes our community and, and what, what, you know, over the years that I've done this show, now going into its 16th year, mm -hmm. um, I never wanted to speak about our community as being lacking of anything. Okay. or lagging anything. Somewhere in our community, somebody's at the cutting edge. Yes. Somebody's demonstrable yes. of what's about to come. You and I were talking before the show started that when the president first took office, he ought to be getting accolades for bringing the digital revolution. That's in fact, right. I, I tell That's people right. all the time, I, when was, you cannot tell me you went to whitehouse.gov before President Barack Obama. Because if no, you did, I did. <laughs> There wasn't nothing there. There wasn't <laughs> nothing did, to look I at. I didn't, I didn't. And here you have our president who is on YouTube very effectively, a, a range of digital media. The White House is awash a with content. Yeah. If you want to really know what uh, President Obama is about, you can find out yourself. You don't have to have the intermediaries tell you. You can go read his speeches. You can read his policy statements. But yet, oftentimes, we are not portrayed collectively in our community as innovators. So now here is a chance for a vulnerable 110 year old institution to play the role of innovator, to play the role of leading agent. Yes. Is, is, is that the level of energy that's in the hallways now with you and Cheryl and the rest of your team? Absolutely. Are those the kinds of- Absolutely, we have our digital daily mm -hmm. and we also have our uh, printed copy online and every day we have to, you know, bring the news to the people. Mm -hmm. We have to create and introduce and expose them to things they may not be thinking about or they may not be aware of, you know, that will hopefully evoke them to act or just inspire them to, to do something or just, you know, to gain some knowledge and information. So, yes, and so we have at this point in time, you know, platforms that you can uh, receive the newspaper. I mean, we have addressed the platforms that you can receive the paper on all of those. As an accomplished professional, this is your chosen craft. You and words have come to love each other. You, you have yeah. made your life work uh, this work. Are you frustrated in today's time where it seems like people can just walk off the street and say any damn thing they want to say without having a journalistic framework without having, you know, you, I, I'm sure you, you guys at the Defenders say, we just can't put anything under our masthead. No, we're, we're not going to. And, and not going to. No. Uh, are you, uh, so do you think there is... I'm not frustrated, Bruce, but I am very clear, you know, that there's a distinction in people who bring their opinions to the table 
and those of us who research, you understand what I'm saying, mm -hmm. and, and study and, and, and learn about the particular subject that we're talking about. And then also we vet our, you know, our sources. I think that's very important. And in fact, it's one of the things that I've been speaking about in my e-notes, that the whole world of social media now is very pedestrian. Mm -hmm. And there's no requirement, you know. There's, uh, uh, you know, there's this, you can be anybody, come from anywhere, and you decide that you're an authority on the way <laughs> others dress. You know, you're an authority on anything and everything and nothing. And you make statements. A lot of people just make erroneous statements that haven't been followed up or checked out. And they can cause people um, a lot of detriment in their lives. I mean, I think about Shirley Sherrod. Mm. Remember mm -hmm. uh, how uh, she had been appointed uh, by the uh, current administration and uh, some blogger, okay, uh, decided that he was gonna pull excerpts from a speech that she had made. And apparently the, the way, it was, the, way the, the, the excerpts were pulled, it slanted what she was saying as to be derogatory to the NAACP. So word got out, and the next thing you know, they fired the lady, and then after the firing, they had this huge apology to make, and then, of course, offered her the job. Well, I mean, it's it's too you late. know it's too late. Mm -hmm. And who's gonna you know you don't there's no guarantee that people are gonna come back and even read that you know because it's not news. That's not sexy. That's not hot. The apology you know isn't. So this industry that has gone uh, and shed so many jobs because mm -hmm. of all of the uh, you know, the, the, the outflows of capital from advertising dollars because the ad game moved to wherever it moved to mm -hmm. and it left newspapers or magazines or print on the side. And so as a result, uh, today you see even journalism schools uh, wanting to take journalism out of their name and say, <laughs> well, we're the school of digital media and we're oh my God. whatever else. So then what do you, to, 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 to continue this process of innovation, what kind of talent needs to be at the table and what kind of skills do they need to, to acquire so they can be part of, of not just get out here with, you know, shoot from the hip, but what are some of the skill sets that you would like to see? Because I, one of the things you said I think is so critical to um, the insight that you portray is you said that you and Cheryl, Cheryl said, I want to bring my team Together. That's right. That's right. And when I talk to entrepreneurs, I really try to encourage them that teams win. That's right. Players play. That's right. If you're trying to scale and create jobs and wealth and an impact on your community, you have to look around and say, who is on my team? Well, it's very interesting. And I just want to uh, point something out to you about that early on as a, you know, young, you're, um, I mean, a young journalist. And you remember how, you know how I used to look. You know, and I started working with uh, Elan, you know, magazine, and I worked along with Tom Rivers, who is one of my um, mentors, and he and um, Mr. Jackson, Herbert C. Jackson, who was the art director at the time, mm -hmm. had come to me and said, would you like to be the editor? You know, I just wanted to be a writer. I just wanted to write. And I said, well, yeah. And of course, I was running around with bangles up to here. You know, my hair at the time was all over my hair, just wild and, you know, free. And one day, Tom said, Kai, I was like, yeah, he said, you been to the bank lately? And I was like, yeah. He said, you see how those people dress? And I said, yeah. He said, you think you could do that? We got an appointment at Burrell, you know. So unbeknownst to me, they had flipped a coin and uh, the one who, uh, one had to go take me to discuss this whole dress thing, you know. So anyway, it happened to be Mr. Jackson. And he started out by telling me, and particularly at that time, we're talking about the 80s, you know, he was saying, you know, Kai, uh, everybody who works wears a uniform. And I argued. I said, no, they don't. He said, yes, they do. I was like, no, they don't, you know. So I said, well, IBM doesn't wear a uniform. He's like, yes, yes they, they do, do. <laughs> right? So we went through that. But the, the, 
the bottom line of the story was you wear a uniform because you're on a team mm -hmm. and they have to be able to recognize you. It's real, real simple, you know. So let's say your, your, your uniform are gray, is gray suits, you know, white shirts, whatever, black shoes. If you come in, you know, and you have on a different color tie, it means that you're not a team player. You want to be different. And if you want to be seen as different, then you're not a part of the team. Now, what most people don't get is when you play on the team, you're brought to the team based on your particular mm -hmm. unique skill and expertise. So you're already different. Mm -hmm. You understand what I'm right. saying? And so that's, that's the part that we miss. And so many people want to be the star, okay? Mm -hmm. The star before you even produce, you know, your particular form of excellence. So as... I look at youth today, the first thing that they want to do is become an expert at something, be excellent at something. Mm -hmm. And uh, particularly for people who want to go into the field of communication, I feel it's very, very important that you still know how to write, that you still know how to spell, that you understand grammar. You know, you know what I mean? Now, now, and they're not doing that. Will not there, a very good job of it. Th there's a lot of angst and frustration with uh, young people today mm -hmm. because they don't see themselves reflected in a range of opportunities and positions. When somebody talks about tech, they seem to say they always show the bespeckled uh, young person from the boondocks or something. Mm -hmm. and they don't see a lot of different people. Um, do you see part of your role and what will come out of the excellence that will be instilled in this work of the Chicago Defender? in scaling up an organization so that you possibly could be home to young people because there are people right now today at a Howard University. Yes. They may be at a Northwestern. They may have acquired some of these skills. And when they come out, they're going to be looking for some different opportunities and to make a reasonable return on their investment. The news I heard today about the uh, chopping of Pell Grants might mean that some people may be coming out with even larger responsibilities to pay the debts of that education. Are you going to be a, 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 a place that will not just be a place for a few, but could be a place for many who select this craft to be their own? To answer your question, yes. And uh, I feel that we're already doing that. I have, you know, a young staff person or young staff people already. And one of the things that I'm constantly telling them is that they, if you write well, that's wonderful, but that's not enough. You have to continue to read. You have to study. You have to be abreast, not only of what's just going on in the world now, but what went on in the world. Because when you go after that story, you've got to be able to frame it mm -hmm. in a historical context and how it's related to right now. And so, yeah, I, I, I think of myself or fancy myself as a, me as a mentor, mm -hmm. certainly. And the Defender, the Chicago Defender, is a training ground for, you know, future journalists. Now, the other part of that is the business equation that um, when we look in our community in regards to the diversity of entrepreneurship, clearly on some parts of town, we don't see all of the business presence that we'd like to see. The range of shops and stores and services. And, and right now, that's an imbalance. We, we, we have this question where we talk about we don't want to spend money with people who don't properly respect us. But if we're going to spend some of that money in our community, we want the quality. We want the services. Um, advertising is critical to product and customer demand. So the role of what you can do to bring visibility marketing to reflect on businesses, you need entrepreneurs who can afford to advertise, be engaged, be part of that process. This is, uh, are, are there people within the hallways that are contemplating, how do we create that engagement so yes. that we can be working yes. for nascent yes. entrepreneurs yes. and not just take an ad from the big guys, but try to find some, some avenue where we can raise up a crop of, of entrepreneurs who can then be a part of having a bigger audience, having a bigger level of engagement? Well, certainly, and, and one of the things that I think is most important is to understand that we're not mainstream media, 
And so a lot of the things that we focus on, even though they may be, you know, a national or international um, concern or circumstance, we're also community. And so the types of stories that we go after, the types of stories that we tell, could very well be about Bruce Montgomery, you know, who is one of our own. And so we profile, you know, our business people, you know, all the time, and um, entrepreneurs, whoever. We take a look at what our community needs, and we go after that. So a lot of our uh, sales focus or sales themes, you know, center around that. For instance, we have an insert that comes out quarterly, but we will be going monthly, which is called Living Well, right? And then we have other such, you know, inserts that focus on particular industries to attract you know, that particular business person or entrepreneur. Well, that's really what I, I'm interested in. As a lifelong marketer, I, I, only, I only ended up in the technology world, but I basically came out of the marketing paradigm. And I've always been frustrated that uh, I, I feel that our best and our, our brightest, when we talk about people like Tom Rivers, who came out of the New York Times, and we talk about Burrell, and we talk about all these wonderfully smart and talented people, they've made millions for the major brands yeah. through the major channels, and very rarely did they get a chance to work on uh, uplifting the entrepreneurs. But we're going to uh, delve into this question of business and technology and intersection. Uh, this conversation is too exciting to stop, so uh, we're gonna continue this, and we're gonna come back in our second portion of this interview and really get into some of the particulars of how the Chicago Defender is innovating, bringing technology to the fore, and maybe creating a platform that will enhance the economic prosperity of our community as we move forward. Is that all right? That's perfect. Thank you, Bruce. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. And we're going to uh, uh, continue this conversation. We're going to come back and we're going to add another guest to this conversation. So in the second part of this dialogue, we're going to get into all these subjects. I, I know you love this conversation. Obviously, we could talk forever, but we've got some substance to give you because we want to give you some solutions that you can use to leverage this great brand, leverage this great institution, and leverage what you have in mind for your opportunities in this coming year. This is Bruce Montgomery, this is Technology Access Television. We'll be back in just a moment. Stick around.